energy and the first law of thermodynamics. That'll be the topic of this lesson on a whole chapter on thermochemistry. We're, we're going to study pretty much like the transfer of energy and the change in energy over the course of a chemical reaction, things of this sort. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is twofold. I want to make science both understandable and I really hope to make learning it enjoyable. Now, this is my new high school chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post another lesson. All right, so energy and the first law of thermodynamics. So first gotta just talk about what in the world is energy. And it's not the easiest thing to define, but we're gonna come up with a very simple definition. It might be nebulous, you know, what exactly energy is, but simply energy is the ability to do work. So, which is truth be told, I don't really think it's the greatest definition. You know, usually we think of some sort of like, you know, uh, cosmic definition or something like this, but it's just simply the ability to do work. Something that has energy, when you have energy, you have the ability to do work, same kind of thing. So uh, the ability to do work, that's gonna be our working definition here. Um, and so when we talk about work as well, it turns out there's a very formal definition for work, but work is the ability to impart energy <laughs> to another object. So it's kind of hand in hand, tongue in cheek. They're not the best definitions, but there are working definitions we'll use in this chapter. So again, energy is the ability to do work and work is the ability to impart energy to some other object. Um, when we're looking at energy and work for that matter, so they're both have an SI unit of joules with a capital J there. That's our SI unit. So, but commonly you'll see uh, in the British uh, system as well, you'll see the, the term calorie used as well with a lowercase c here. And it turns out that one calorie is equal to 4.18 joules. So, and you'll commonly see both these used in kind of this section, but you'll definitely see joules used more commonly being that it is the SI unit for both energy and work. Now, one thing you should realize from the get-go here is that this calorie here with a lowercase c is different than a calorie with a capital C. So here, if I do one calorie with a capital C, it turns out this is a kilocalorie with a lowercase c, which means it is 1,000 calories with a lowercase c. So this is your nutritional calories, often how it's referred to. And so when you look at your Snickers bar that you've just eaten, and it says, you know, 180 calories, it's using the capital C here, but that would be 180 kilocalories or really 180,000 calories. So the next time you catch your friend, you know, eating a Snickers, be like, you pig, you're eating 180,000 calories or something to that effect. effect. But uh, just wanted to make sure you realize that distinction from the get-go. When we use this little calorie, this is much smaller than the nutritional calorie you'll see on all your food labels. Okay, so now we've got to talk about uh, just the different types of energy. And there are six main types of energy, and these are thermal energy, so heat. This is radiant energy, light. So mechanical energy, which is, is the ability to do mechanical work on a system and stuff like that. Like right now, me moving my arms, that's uh, through the process of mechanical energy. Uh, that's mechanical energy on display, you might say. Uh, we've got chemical energy, and this is energy um, that's essentially stored in bonds. And we've got chemical reactions going on. All you're really doing is making and breaking bonds. And energy can be transferred and converted to different forms in that process. Uh, we've also got electrical energy, uh, and then finally nuclear energy, uh, which we'll have I'll study just a little tiny bit at the very end of this course. Cool. So those are six fundamental types of energy. I don't think it's necessary that you actually like go, you know, through the, the arduous process of memorizing them all. But I just wanted you to realize that there really are just these six types of energy. And we'll find out that we can kind of convert back and forth between some of these different forms uh, in a lot of cases. One other thing you should know uh, is that in a physics context, you might actually study uh, and, and break up the different types of energy into just two types. So we might call it kinetic energy and potential energy. And kinetic energy is the energy of motion and potential energy is some kind of like stored energy that might give you the potential for motion. And, and really that's just two different classes of energy rather than types of energy, which is really not the greatest distinction and stuff. But we won't talk about those much in this class, but you'll talk about those heavily in a physics discussion. But in chemistry here, uh, we might just pay lip service to the different types of energy, but we really won't use the terms, you know, potential and kinetic energy too much. Every once in a blue moon, especially in the context of like gas or something, we might pay lip service to them, but in a, in a proper discussion of energy in a physics context, you would talk about them quite a bit. All right, from here, we want to talk about what's known as the first law of thermodynamics. And there are, it turns out, four laws of thermodynamics. There is the zeroth law, the first law, the second law, the third law. So, 
And we will not be talking about the second law or the third law at all in a high school chemistry class. So in a, in a more advanced course, we'll talk about those. And we won't be talking about the zeroth law either. We're only going to be talking about the first law. So that makes it easy. Because then the only law of thermodynamics you got to know is that first law. And it simply says that uh, energy cannot be created or destroyed. So it's kind of the way we look at it. Or some people refer to it as the conservation of energy. Another way to look at this then is that energy can be converted from one of the six forms into a different of the six forms, but the total amount of energy that exists before and after that conversion process is gonna be the same because energy can't be created or destroyed. Now we can also look at this in a mathematical sense as well. Let's give some room here. And so uh, in looking at that first law of thermodynamics from a mathematical approach, we look at a change in energy, and technically this stands for what's known as the internal energy of a system, but I'm just gonna look at the change in energy for now, is equal to Q plus W here, where Q is heat that is either transferred into or out of your system, which we'll define here in a sec, and then work is energy that can be transferred into or out of the system through work as well. So these are the two different ways that energy can be transferred into or out of a system through either a change in heat or a change in work. And so Q and W here are often referred to as heat and work, but I really like calling them a change in heat and a change in work. We don't use the delta symbol here like we do with this one, but one thing you should get used to is that this delta symbol actually means change in something. And so here it's change in energy. If I will use delta T later in this chapter, and that'll be change in temperature. Things sort. So delta always means change uh, in any kind of context you're going to see in a chemistry world. All right. And for that reason, I really wish we would put delta Q and delta W, but it's just not how we define the variables. But this really is a change in heat energy and a change in work energy, or really it's the way that energy is transferred into or out of a system. And, and so I'm talking about a system here. So turns out if you've ever been in love and maybe you're young enough that you haven't yet, but when you have fallen in love, you'll find out that there's only two things in the universe. There's the person you're in love with and there is everything else. And in chemistry, we define something similar. We talk about two things in the whole universe. There's the system, which just happens to be the thing you're looking at. It might be a chemical reaction, so it might be an object, but it's the thing you're looking at and then there's just everything else. And so the thing you're looking at, we call the system. Everything else we're going to call the surrounding, and it's, and it's everything in the entire universe besides what you're looking at. Cool, and you can transfer energy into the system from the surroundings, or you can transfer energy out of the system into the surroundings. Energy can flow both directions, so in most cases. Now, we can talk about like a closed system in which that's not gonna happen and things of a sort, but we're not gonna discuss that in this class. In a more advanced course, we start talking about different types of systems and some that can exchange matter and some that can exchange energy and some that can't exchange either and all that stuff, but that's not gonna be relevant to us. But we do wanna explore this exchange in energy between the system and the surroundings. And so again, this happens in two different ways. So we can have heat, so transferred into the system from the surroundings. And in that case, that's when Q is gonna be defined as being a positive number. And so when we define Q and W, it turns out we're gonna define them always relative to the system. If the system gains energy, we'll call it positive. And so the same thing here, we will be able to transfer work energy to the system. And this happens when work is done on the systems. And what does work on the system? The only other thing that exists, the surroundings. And so you might hear work is done on the system, or you might hear that the surroundings do work on the system. Either one of those means that energy is being transferred into the system through mechanical work. So if you look at this marker right here, it turns out there's something called gravitational potential energy. And as I raise this marker up in the air, I'm giving it more and more gravitational potential energy. I'm doing mechanical work. The muscles in my arm are doing mechanical work to give this marker more energy. Now, the same thing could happen if I just threw a marker against the wall over there. So, and in that case, I was giving it kinetic energy instead of gravitational potential energy. But in either case, I was using work to give a marker energy. Let's pick that marker back up. Cool, and so in either case, the surroundings was the whole universe, everything besides the marker. The marker's my system, and then my arm here was part of the surroundings, and it was the part that was actually imparting the mechanical work to it in both cases. Cool, so when the system gains energy, Q and W are positive. Now, you can also have energy leave the system, 
And so if heat leaves the system to the surroundings, that's when we would define Q as being negative. Now, if you're part of the surroundings, you're gaining that heat. But again, everything is always defined for the relative to the system, not relative to the surroundings. And so when the system loses that heat, that's when Q is going to be a negative number. Same thing on the other with work. When the system loses energy through work, so in this case, it's not that work is being done on the system, it's now that work is being done by the system. And what is the system working on? The only other thing that exists in the universe. So the system is doing work on the surroundings. And when the system does work, it loses energy. Same kind of thing as you. If you're the system, and if you're doing a bunch of work, you know, once you do a, you know, a full day's worth of work, and you're doing yard work, let's say, or something like that, you're gonna end up having a lot less energy at the end of the day, in all likelihood. And so you have lost energy Energy and work here would be negative because you as the system lost energy in the process. So when work is done on the system, work is positive number. When work is done by the system on the surroundings, work is a negative number. And you might get some simple calculations of plugging in, you know, Q and W values based on the semantics, on the wording. And so maybe I give you a question. I say, what would be the change in internal energy if 50 joules of heat was transferred from the surroundings to the system? Let's stop there for a second. So if 50 joules of heat was transferred from the surroundings to the system, that would mean we're transferring energy in the form of heat into the system, and it's going to be positive 50 joules. So here we'd have positive 50 joules. All right, that's the first half. So again, what would delta E be if 50 joules of heat was transferred from the surroundings to the system and 20 joules of work was done by the surroundings on the system. So 20 joules of work is done by the surroundings on the system. And when work is done on the system, not by the system, but on the system, that system's going to gain the energy as well. And so in this case, with 20 joules of work being done on the system, that would be another plus 20 joules. So in terms of work, and therefore the, the total change in internal energy here, and I don't know why I'm writing delta E again, but would in this case be positive 70 joules. Cool. So this is kind of how it works. And based on the semantics, you just had to figure out, you know, was Q positive or negative and then put in the value. And again, based on the, on the wording was W positive or negative based on the wording. And then you can add them together to get delta E. Cool. So that's kind of how this would work in a semantics sort of way. Now, one of the most common systems we'll look at is a system of a gas. So, and if you look at a system of a gas, just some random gas in some container somewhere in the universe. So we'll call that our system and the whole rest of the universe would be our surroundings. For that system of a gas, there's a certain type of work we'll talk about often and it's called PV work. And PV work here stands for pressure volume work. Now it turns out to do work on something, you've got to apply a force and it needs to move. You've got to do a displacement here. And in this case, you can push on a gas so and cause its volume to change. And when you apply a force over a certain area on a gas, that's actually what pressure is. Not super important yet, but when we get to the gas chapter, it will be. So, but that's why this ends up you know, being analogous to a f applying a force and getting a displacement on a gas, pressure times volume. And this PV work has a equation for it, work equals negative P delta V here. So negative pressure times the change in volume. And sometimes we get really technical here and we say it's the external pressure, just the pressure on the gas being applied on the gas, so to speak. So, and I'll be technical since we'll define it here, but it's just the pressure on the gas. So, and then the change in the gas's volume. If you apply, you know, a force onto a gas, but its volume doesn't change, well, then you haven't done any work in that case. Now, something very tricky about this is that if you want this to come out in joules, you have a problem. And that problem deals with the fact that Joules is the SI unit. Well, normally we use pressure, you'll find out in the gas chapter. We use atmospheres a whole lot and we use uh, volumes in liters a whole lot. However, if you want this to work out to get joules, you've got to use SI units. And so typically we look at pressures being measured in pascals times a change in volume being measured in meters cubed because a pascal meter cube turns out is a joule. So if you were going to do some calculation with this, most commonly they'd want you to convert it into joules in the end and you'd have to convert your pressure and your delta V into pascals and meters cubed. So 
Cool. We're not going to cover this just yet because we haven't actually covered the chapter in gases just yet. But when we get to a, a chapter on gases, a few chapters down the road, we will see some calculations along these lines. But uh, by and large, though, you'll find out that when we do most of our calculations with gases, we'll typically do pressures in atmospheres, not pascals, and we'll typically do volumes or volume changes in liters, not meters cubed. This is one case where we might try to be really specific on our units. So again, that the work would come out in joules. One thing you should note about this lovely equation, so is your pressure is always a positive number. There's no such thing as a negative pressure. Now we might colloquially talk about negative pressure and that really just means a negative difference in pressure, a lower pressure, but there's no such thing as an actual absolute negative pressure. So pressure is always gonna be a positive number here, but your change in volume can be positive or negative. When a gas expands, let's write that down. We refer to that as an expansion. And when you've got an expansion, delta V is positive. And a positive number times a positive pressure times a negative sign means your work is going to come out negative. All right, work is less than zero, a negative number. And you can kind of think of it this way. So when you've got a gas and you've got these gas molecules, when it wants to expand, it has to push the surroundings back. And to push those surroundings back is going to cost energy. It's going to require the gas to do work to push the surroundings back. And when the gas, which is the system we're looking at, does work, when your system does work, it's losing energy. And that's why work here would be a negative number. Now, opposite of, a comp uh, of an expansion is what we call a compression of the gas. So, and if your gas is compressed instead, notice the gas isn't compressing itself, it's the surroundings that are compressing it. Even in the way we, we, we state this, the language shows that it's the surroundings doing the work. So when a gas is compressed by the surroundings, so it's delta V is negative. Its final volume is smaller than its initial volume. So it's delta V is negative and a negative times a positive times a negative is gonna get you a positive value for work. And so when a gas is compressed, when it undergoes a compression, that's when your work is going to come out positive. That's when your gas would gain energy. And it makes sense too. A compressed gas has way more energy than one that is not compressed, one that's just spread out. And so, because by the process of compressing it gives it a lot more energy. So that's your first law of thermodynamics here. And so again, you should know that energy can't be created or destroyed, or it might be phrased as conservation of energy. You should know that this is the mathematical expression for the first law. And you might be like, that's how, that means the same thing as energy can't be created or destroyed. It does. So if I told you that there's this system here, and if I came back in an hour and it had a hundred more joules of energy, the conclusion wouldn't be, wow, energy was just created magically inside that system. No, it's that 100 joules of energy was in some way, shape, or form through heat or work transferred into the system. That's why in the way of saying that delta E is equal to the transfer of heat or, the, or work being done on or by the system, that's why that's a statement of the first law because it's not saying that energy was just created or destroyed within the system. It's that energy can be transferred in or out of the system, but it can't just be created or destroyed. So that's why this is a, a mathematical description of that. Uh, you should understand how to assign whether Q is positive or negative and whether W is positive or negative just based on uh, the wording and stuff like this. And you might have to do a simple calculation with it. Finally, you should understand that for specifically a gas, there's something called PV work. And for an expansion, your work will come out negative. And for compression, your work will come out positive. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share. A couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems or if you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.